Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we're pleased to interview Donna Gilmore of San Onofre Safety, who shares some new information on what's wrong with dry cask storage of plutonium-riddled spent fuel rods. She raises some serious new questions about the presumed safety of this technology. Plus, we will, of course, have our popular Numb Nuts of the Week feature, Nuclear Reactor Duck, and Cover Report, and more honest nuclear information than shows up anywhere in the newly leaked Panama Papers. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, April 5th, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Actually, we're providing two weeks of news, because with last week's special on the Three Mile Island 37th anniversary, we kind of skipped over the news section. So today is going to bring you up to date on two weeks, and boy, it's been busy, especially in North St. Louis, where we have the problem of the World War II nuclear weapons waste that has been illegally buried at the Westlake landfill, and now we find out that it has migrated out to well beyond the limits of Westlake. Data released on Friday, April 1st, by the Missouri Department of Natural Resources shows two soil samples on private property have levels of radioactive thorium higher than that which is allowed for unrestricted use by the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, including one sample that was three times higher than the limit. Ed Smith of the Missouri Coalition for the Environment, calls the findings fairly significant. He said, The EPA has said previously that the radioactivity is not off-site, and it appears the Missouri Department of Natural Resources has found radioactivity off-site. So comprehensive off-site testing all the way around the landfill is needed. We have to know where all the radioactivity is before it can be cleaned up. The U.S. EPA has said that it will clean up the radioactive contamination on the adjacent sites and that it is going to have a final plan for addressing the radioactive waste at Westlake by December. This after many years, if not decades, of fluffing their responsibilities there. Documentation has now surfaced showing that the EPA has known that they had off-site contamination at the Westlake landfill since as early as 1991. And in 1999, the EPA was asked by the responsible parties to be allowed to clean up the waste because of the potential for migration. And at that point, for whatever reason, the EPA did not allow it, even though it was described as a time-critical removal action. It's even more time-critical now because of the underground fire at the adjacent Bridgeton landfill, which has been burning for over five years and is encroaching upon the area where radioactive material was known to be buried. Well, with the announcement of the Environmental Protection Agency in its most recent monthly report, that what they call radiologically impacted material is now found to be present in the north quarry of the Bridgeton landfill, meaning it's closer to the fire than previously thought, only 500 yards away. There is now a long-standing community battle over the Westlake landfill cleanup with Just Moms St. Louis and other activists fighting to allow the Army Corps of Engineers to do the cleanup. They are equipped to do it, they are experienced in it, and it is only a technical glitch, a legal glitch, that has the EPA handling this or mishandling this instead of the Army Corps of Engineers and their FUSRAP program. Well, with all this information hitting the fan, it's no surprise that last week, very suddenly, the two leaders of Just Moms L.A., 
Karen Nickel and Don Chapman, found themselves taking an abrupt overnight trip to Washington, D.C., to meet with White House staff on the Council on Environmental Quality. This is the arm of the White House that is above the EPA. The meeting was set up by Lois Marie Gibbs of Love Canal fame and was attended by Don Chapman, Karen Nickel, the aforementioned Ed Smith of Missouri Coalition for the Environment, Lois Gibbs, Stephen Lester of Center for Health, Environment, and Justice, and representatives from both the Teamsters Union and Missouri Attorney General Chris Coster's Chief of Staff. Because of the meeting that took place with the Council on Environmental Quality, the boss of the APA, keep in mind, guess who popped up but Gina, never met a nuke I didn't like and cover for, McCarthy, who after years of being battered with phone calls, email, faxes, and other forms of communication, begging her to pay attention to these moms and have a meeting with them, suddenly she was available. Come on down. We will have a report on what took place at that meeting with representatives who were at the meeting at a future episode of Nuclear Hot Seat. Suffice it to say that all of the activists handled the situation brilliantly, talking with Gina about the human factor of what was involved, and gave Gina McCarthy two weeks to start coming up with something substantive that they can use to help protect their health and the lives and health and safety of the children of North St. Louis and, quite frankly, beyond. Or to quote a statement from Congresswoman Ann Wagner, who co-introduced House Bill 4100 to allow the Army Corps of Engineers to take over the cleanup, she said, I am disappointed the EPA has once again proven they cannot be trusted to properly manage the danger to public health at the Westlake Landfill. For years, the agency has assured families that the radioactive material was isolated to one area, and we now know that is not the case. We must prioritize the safety and security of those living in the Westlake community which is why I will not stop fighting until the EPA hands over management of the landfill to the trusted Army Corps of Engineers. To be continued. In another national nuclear mess, the National Nuclear Security Administration, God only knows where that one came from, I've never encountered it in five years of doing this show, But the NNSA has issued a record of decision that it is going to take all plutonium that has been sent to the Savannah River site from foreign countries and process it for disposal at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, site in Carlsbad, New Mexico. What's wrong with this picture? First of all, why in the world is the U.S. the dumping ground for nuclear waste from Switzerland? Germany, Japan, and the WIP site has been closed since an underground explosion of waste in a 55-gallon drum from Los Alamos National Laboratory exploded on Valentine's Day of 2014. The underground site and its ventilation stack were contaminated with americium and plutonium, which were released, and for the first half hour of the accident, vented into the surrounding area. Even attempts to clean up the underground facility was stopped on February 22nd of this year because they couldn't get enough oxygen underground to operate underground and still provide enough to breathe for the people who were there. There was just too much carbon monoxide and volatile organic compounds. So we're bringing the stuff in from other countries. We have no place to put it And it's all going to be parked at Savannah River site in Georgia. Remind me to avoid peaches this year. And now it's time for the nuclear hot seat duck (laughs) and cover report. At the Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant, only 25 miles away from New York City, Hundreds of faulty and missing bolts were discovered during a planned outage that will keep the reactor shut down for several additional weeks. What's wrong with forever? 
The scheduled inspection at the power plant of more than 2,000 bolts on the face of a removable insert liner in the plant's number two reactor revealed issues. I love the way they phrase that. Issues with about 11% of the bolts or 220 of them. The issues included missing bolts and other degradation requiring replacement of the bolts. This according to Slumlord Energy, which runs the place. Paul Gallet, president of environmental watchdog group Riverkeeper, said, This unprecedentedly serious damage right at the core of Indian Point Reactor 2 makes it even harder for Metro New York area residents to ignore the unfathomable risks that this nuclear plant poses to us every day. Earlier this year, radioactive tritium-contaminated water at 650 times the permissible levels set by the EPA was discovered in samples of groundwater monitoring wells. (coughs) At Callaway Nuclear Generating Station in Missouri, only 100 miles from St. Louis, on April 4th, the plant went into cold shutdown with all control rods inserted in the reactor. Something about reactor trip breakers that they turned off and then they reopened. All by themselves. Oops! (coughs) And this Friday, April 8th, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and FEMA will conduct a full-scale training exercise at the Next Era Energy Seabrook Station nuclear power plant in Seabrook, New Hampshire. According to FEMA, this exercise allows federal teams to examine the ability of the participating local, state, and utility officials to protect the health and safety of the public living near the Seabrook nuclear power plant in the event of a radiological release. Do they know something that we don't? In this entire article, not once was the word evacuation mentioned, which raises the question, what does the community do with this so-called full-scale training exercise? Do they shelter in place? Simulate evacuation? That would be a big laugh. And how will the public be informed when this radiological release happens? No answers from FEMA. (coughs) And Diane Turco of Cape Downwinders and Pilgrim Watch demonstrated the kind of security problems at the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Facility that emphasize the need to shut it down. While being filmed by Channel 7 local news talking about the lack of security at Pilgrim, She then walked on the property past the guard station and no trespassing signs. She continued into the building where employees were scanning for entrance while two security guards walked by her to the street where the Channel 7 team remained. The news team did not go on to Energy property. Diane said she was able to walk right off the property without any security stopping her. The Plymouth police were called and arrived, but it was after she had left. There were four security guards with guns in front of her, and no one stopped her when she was on the property. Yet another reason to shut Pilgrim. And that's this week's Duck! (coughs) And cover report. Two more reactor stories. This one's a good one. It's final. The Fitzpatrick Nuclear Power Plant in Oswego, New York, will permanently shut down as of January 2017. It's a GE boiling water reactor, the same design as the reactors at Fukushima in Japan. According to Jessica Azoulay, program director for the Alliance for a Green Economy, a group which has been calling for the closing of the facility for the past four years, she said, we're relieved to know that there's a date certain that this reactor will stop operating. We've been extremely concerned about the safety issues there. Now the neighboring Nine Point Nuclear Station in Oswego County is facing similar financial distress. Only they're whining about it, saying, We're losing a lot of money, and they could someday face an early closure like it's Oswego County neighbor Fitzpatrick. Unless state officials develop price supports for upstate nuclear plants, a top company official said on Wednesday. Economic blackmail. Nah. Lose your money, shut down. Over to Japan, where good news from a couple of months ago turns out isn't so good after all. 
Public prosecutors decided on Tuesday, March 29, not to indict Tokyo Electric Power Company President Naomi Hirose and other current and former executives of the utility over radioactive water leaks from the crippled Fukushima nuclear power plant into the ocean. Why did they allow that to happen? Well, they said sufficient evidence was not found. Well, did you bother to look? The prosecutors actually said that there was no evidence supporting the allegation that leaked tainted water, meaning radioactive water, from Fukushima was carried into the sea, meaning the Pacific Ocean, by groundwater at the plant. And of course, the lack of proof that there was any radioactive water from the groundwater going into the Pacific Ocean is the reason why TEPCO has been spending millions of dollars building a frozen wall to try and keep that groundwater out of the Pacific Ocean. It starts to hurt the head after a while. Most recently, an estimated 5.3 tons of water contaminated with radiation leaked from a pipe in a building housing cesium removal equipment at Fukushima. The water contained 383,000 becquerels of radioactive cesium per liter. It's well known that between 300,000 and 400,000 gallons of radioactive water per day were pouring out of the facility into the Pacific Ocean. But gee, they just can't find that radioactive water when it comes to getting those TEPCO executives. And Fukushima was not TEPCO's first nuclear accident. And cover-up. The Kashiwazaki Kariwa nuclear power plant in Niigata Prefecture had TEPCO execs concealing evidence of stress cracks and covering up the fact that the plant was built near fault lines which came to light after a 6.8 earthquake epicentered only 15 miles offshore from the facility shook the plant greater than it was designed to withstand. They wriggled out of the consequences for that one, too. The one good piece of news is that Shikoku Electric Power Company plans to give up restarting Reactor 1 of its Ikata nuclear complex in Ahime Prefecture, because extending the aging unit's lifespan would be hugely expensive. The reactor will reach its 40th birthday in 2016. Since Fukushima, no reactor in Japan is allowed to run longer than 40 years without applying for an extension to the Nuclear Regulatory Authority in advance. And another one bites the dust. Over to Belgium where it is now known that the terrorists who unleashed the attacks at the Brussels airport and on a packed metro that killed 31 people and injured hundreds were actually initially planning to attack a nuclear power station. It is now known that the ISIS cell was spying on Belgium's nuclear power chief, possibly as part of a kidnap plan to force him to let them into the atomic facility. 12 hours of reconnaissance footage has been reported, and it appears that one of Brussels' four nuclear reactors was the initial target. It is suspected that the arrests of the accomplices of the terrorists the previous week may have forced them to switch targets to the Brussels airport and the metro. Two days after the bomb attacks, a security guard who worked at a Belgian nuclear plant was murdered and his pass stolen. The security guard's badge was deactivated as soon as it was discovered that he had been shot dead. Scott Port's line of Three Mile Island Alert pointed out that the nuclear plant in the story where the guard was working is a nuclear isotopes reactor facility and not a nuclear power plant. It is not known whether the death of this guard is related to the terrorist attacks or not, but it sure is suspicious. In Spain... Five inspectors from the Spanish Nuclear Safety Council reported serious failings in the water pump engines at the Almaraz nuclear power plant. These failings raise doubts about the operability of the cooling system and pose a serious risk to local people and to the environment in Spain and Portugal. Almaraz has been described by Greenpeace as an extreme case, in its study on the application of minimum safety standards introduced in Europe after the Fukushima accident. 
Interestingly, the red flag on safety at Almaraz was raised by someone in neighboring Portugal. My favorite story this week comes from South Korea, where civic groups protested against a Japanese sake festival that was held in Seoul on Friday, March 25th. The protesters were trying to prevent visitors from tasting possibly dangerous alcohol produced in areas near the Fukushima nuclear plant disaster five years ago. Eleven civic groups held a press conference in front of the Japanese embassy in Jongno-gu, demanding that Japan stop the Seoul Sake Festival 2016. One of the protesters said, Seven of the participating Japanese breweries made their liquor in areas near Fukushima, where our government has warned of possible danger from radiation. The breweries must have made their liquor using water and rice from the area. Such liquors will jeopardize our health. And now... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of the week. Leave it to the Russians. They have the Kola nuclear power plant in Murmansk, which is in the far, far northwest corner of the country, very close to northern Finland, Norway, and Sweden. Now, despite the fact that the Kola nuclear power plant produces only 500 megawatts of unneeded energy per year, Russia's nuclear utility, Rosanir Goitem, is holding a tender, an offer, for upgrades to the station's number one reactor with the aim for running it for 60 years. Now, the engineered lifespans of Reactor 1 and 2 were only supposed to be 30 years. But just like the NRC here in the United States, their running lifetime was extended 15 years so that they're supposed to run until 2018 and 2019. However, the station has worked out Not an engineering plan, not a safety plan, but an investment plan to extend the lifespan of the reactors to 60 years, upping them 15 years apiece. Do I hear 20? Do I? Let's not even go there. Alexander Nikitin, chairman of the Environmental Rights Center, Bellona, said... When making important decisions in Russia's nuclear industry, they look at the economics first and foremost. Other questions like safety come later. And indeed, this year, public hearings will take place to determine whether COLA's number three reactor can be run at power levels of up to 107% of what it should be running at. Station officials thus far haven't offered an articulate answer as to why this is necessary. And that's why Russian agency Rosen Air Goitem and your facility at Kola are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. And my favorite quote of the week comes from Bernie Sanders. He said in an NBC interview, I am very concerned that the Indian Point nuclear power reactor is more than ever before a catastrophe waiting to happen. He released this in his statement on Monday, April 4th. In my view, he said, we cannot sit idly by and hope that the unthinkable will never happen. We must take action to shut this plant down in a safe and responsible way. It makes no sense to me to continue to operate a decaying nuclear reactor within 25 miles of New York City, where nearly 10 million people live. Even in a perfect world, where energy companies didn't make mistakes, nuclear power is, and always has been, a dangerous idea, because there is no good way to store nuclear waste, Sanders said. That is why the United States must lead the world in transforming our energy system away from nuclear power and fossil fuels. Bernie, from your mouth to somebody's ears. We'll have this week's featured interview in just a moment. But first, Nuclear Hot Seat is listener-supported. And if you're listening, that would be you. 
We rely on your donations to help keep us going and growing. There are those pesky monthly running expenses, website assistance, and travel expenses when it's important to get me to the stories that need to be covered. The next planned travel event is in September of this year to the Excellence in Journalism Conference in New Orleans, where I will have the chance to interact with over 1,000 reporters, news directors, station managers, and others who are directly involved in choosing news stories and who may not be aware of the nuclear story worthy of a Pulitzer sitting in their own backyard. It's a chance to really impact national news coverage of nuclear issues. So, whatever you can do to help us meet these goals, please do what you can. A Starbucks donation of the equivalent of a cup of coffee is a great way to get started. Some people set that up as a monthly automatic donation, and it is the best cup of coffee I will never drink. So, it's real easy to donate. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com, click on the big red Donate button, and know that whatever amount you can offer is deeply appreciated. And as always, you have my gratitude. Donna Gilmore is the head of San Onofre Safety. She has become one of the country's leading experts on hardened dry cask storage of nuclear reactor radioactive fuel bundles. What's wrong with the technology as it's being practiced and what we need to do about it? Though not a trained engineer, Donna discovered there were problems with storage of high burn-up nuclear fuel that even the Nuclear Regulatory Commission wasn't aware of, and she was actually invited to give a talk to NRC engineers and managers to alert them to the problems. Now, Donna shares her latest findings with you, the Nuclear Hot Seat audience. Donna, you have been following the situation with the canisters, the dry cask canisters that have been in use and are proposed for long-term storage at San Onofre. I believe they're also in use right now in Diablo Canyon. Bring us up to date on what the problems have been and let us know what you have recently discovered. There are over 2,000 of these thin canisters. Most of them are half-inch thick stainless steel. And that is all that's separating us from a major radiation release. Each canister contains more radioactive cesium-137 than was released from Chernobyl, just one canister. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission had said in a meeting that I participated in, even if there was a crack starting in one of these canisters, it would take at least 16 years before they would leak. So about last week, I found a Sandia lab report, and it showed that because these canisters are hot, that the cracks, once a crack starts, it can grow through the wall, penetrate the wall of the canister in one to five years. Wow. Is there any way to track this or know this is happening so that it can be stopped before it actually breaches the canister? Unfortunately not. Now, one thing I want to make clear that people don't normally understand when they first hear this, the information about how fast cracks grow is pretty well substantiated in the scientific community. The the big unknown is when will a crack start? Because that one to five years starts after the crack is there. Well, there's no scientific method to know when a crack will start in one of these canisters. But what we do know and what the scientists do know in the NRC is that these canisters are all subject to cracking from various atmospheric and other conditions. They can crack from moist salts, can start the cracking process, air pollution from sulfites, such as you find in vehicle and industrial exhaust and coal plants, that kind of thing. The other thing you need is a temperature low enough for the salts and other chemicals to dissolve on the canister. In addition to uh, having salts or other particles on the canister, you need to have enough moisture for the salts or other particles to dissolve onto the canister. 
the NRC had originally told me that it would take at least 30 years before the canisters would be cool enough for moisture to even stay on the hot canister. Well, that turns out not to be true. In 2014, at Diablo Canyon, the NRC hired someone to check the temperature on a couple of canisters at Diablo Canyon and a few other places around the country. And what they found is the temperature was low enough, uh, under 85 degrees centigrade, for moisture to stay on the canister where it could dissolve the salts. They also found salts on the canister at Diablo. This canister was only two years old. So we have all the conditions for cracking. We don't know if the Diablo Canyon canister is cracking because, get this, there is no technology that can inspect for cracks once containers are filled with this highly radioactive nuclear waste, what they call spent fuel rod. So we don't know. Now, this technology, the, the nuclear industry will say, well, we're not aware of any problems. Well, yeah, they're not aware because they can't inspect to know if there's any cracks. So it's a very misleading statement. And with this new information from Sandia Labs about the, you know, one to five year through well crack rate, this becomes an issue that this could happen any time. Now, most of the thin wall canisters that are being used in the United States, they haven't been in use that long. And when you say not long, approximately what's the time frame? Yeah, that they I, there are a few that have been in use over 20 years, but they weren't hot, so they wouldn't have a, a fast crack growth rate. Most some of them have been in use less than 10 years, the majority of them. And they started using high burn-up fuel about a decade ago. They burn it longer in the reactor, so the canisters are twice as hot. So you're going to have a faster crack growth rate with the current ones they're using. What the nuclear industry will say is, oh, we've, you know, we've, we've used dry storage for 40 years. But what they don't tell you is what they used in the beginning were thick wall casts that were 10 to 15 inches thick, and then they switch to the half-inch thick canisters because they were cheaper. The short-sightedness of this is mind-boggling. It's like they're thinking if they can outlive or just be out of the job by the time anything goes wrong, they're going to be fine, as opposed to thinking long-term about what's going to be required to keep us safe in the long run or as safe as possible. From this material? What I find is partly that, but I talk to these people. I've, I've talked to the person running the San Onofre plant. I've talked to the director of all things spent fuel management at the NRC. I've talked to a number of people in this area, including the vendors that make the canisters. And they're basically delusional, and they're, they're trying to rationalize this is all okay and rationalize nothing's going to go wrong, and if something goes wrong, that they'll be able to figure it out at that time. So most people believe them when they say these things because they're people in some position of authority. But when you actually look at the data and the facts, they don't have it right. I seem to be one of the only people that's peeling the onion back and looking at the facts behind these statements. Now, we did get Dr. Singh, who is the president and CEO of Holtec. They're one of the major thin canister makers in the country. We've got him on video saying that even if you could find these cracks, that even microscopic cracks, through well cracks, will release millions of curies of radiation. And even if you could find some way robotically in the face of all that to repair them, repairing the stainless steel canisters will just introduce another area for corrosion and cracking. So it's not really feasible to do that. And we also have the NRC Director of Bent Fuel Management, Mark Lombard, at a Coastal Commission meeting admitting to one of the commissioners that being able to inspect these canisters, we're talking just the outside, not what's like even on the inside. He says it's not a now thing. Wait a minute. Not a now thing? That means they can't inspect them, but he's hoping one of these days they'll be able to. <laughs> That's like in the first days of nuclear reactors when they were first being built. 
the engineers knew that there was no solution for the waste, but they figured, ah, by the time it's an issue, we'll have figured something out. Right, yeah. Tell that to the people living near the Hanford, Washington, where they have a different kind of waste. There's liquid waste that's leaking into the ground. And tell that to the people in Savannah River and pretty much every place where the Department of Energy is managing military waste. I actually brought that up to Mark Lombard. I said, how can you say that you're going to solve this before anything goes wrong when you've got the problems at Hanford and Savannah River? And he, what he says to me is, oh, well, that's the DOE. We're a lot better than they are. <laughs> the term being relative, of course. I mean, it's just it's just crazy. And And the thing that makes it even worse is they have no plan in place that once these things start leaking, they have no plan of how to deal with that. Absolutely none. There's not a single approved plan that these nuclear plants have. The only chance they have is to be able to take a canister and put it back in the pool of water, uh, one of the spent fuel pools. Now, if you have an empty pool, that's likely more doable. If you have a pool that's already filled with other spent fuel, I mean, you run the risk of creating of having a problem where that one canister that's gone bad can contaminate the other spent fuel, which would be not a good thing, of course. And isn't it true that in many of the decommissioned nuclear facilities, they are in the process or there are plans underway to do away with the spent fuel pools once everything is in dry cap? Yes, that's, that's what I was going to mention next. Now, so the one opportunity you have is when a plant decommissions and they unload all the fuel out of the pool into dry storage canisters, one fails, it's safer to take that canister and put it back in the pool. However, San Onofre plans to destroy the pools once it's empty, eliminating the only possible way to deal with leaking canisters. They've got 51 canisters there right now, and they're planning to add at least 85 more and they're not dealing with this problem. You know, we're a few miles from the ocean. The nuclear facility near Sacramento, Rancho Seco, it's been closed for years, and they allowed them to destroy the pool. So there is no pool at Rancho Seco, which is uh, the utility company is SMUD, Sacramento Municipal Utility District. I spoke to a person there, and I said, hey, are you aware of the problem? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, what, what's your plan to deal with it? He goes, oh, well, we're just going to wait till, for the nuclear industry to figure this out. <laughs> and what's the temperature in hell? Has it frozen over yet? I mean, these people are delusional. I'm, 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 you know, I'm sitting here at five of five miles from San Onofre, and after I read that Sandia Lab report, it kind of confirmed what I already knew because I've had a couple, a number of corrosion engineers, including one that works at the NRC, tell me that hotter canisters will grow, uh, the cracks will grow through much faster. But this was the only specific written evidence I found. And I, and I hesitate to say things unless I have some kind of document with a lot of credentials. So I'm very careful to separate speculation from facts and what I do. When I saw that, I just froze. I, I mean, I was staring at my computer screen. And I just froze because I was thinking, gee, I thought we had seven years using the NRC map of 16 years. And now I realize that this could happen any day. And I really haven't totally faced that reality. You know, I mean, I, I really probably should sell my house. But, you know, there's 2,000 of these around the country. I don't know which ones are going to start leaking first. I have evidence that shows that once air reaches the spent fuel in those canisters, that they could actually explode from the hydrides that are built up in those canisters. And then that means that this radiation will go wherever the wind blows. It's unfortunately that bad. And each of those canisters, you said, has as much radiation in them as was released at Chernobyl. So what we're looking at is the equivalent of a homegrown Chernobyl, multiple homegrown Chernobyls, in our backyard because of every spent fuel canister that's out there in the country. Right. Now, they, the, the statistics I have related to just the cesium-137 in Chernobyl, it doesn't address all the other radioactive elements that go along with that. But, yeah, basically you're talking about Chernobyl in a can here, 2,000 of these Chernobyls in a can that are basically ticking time bombs that 
could go off any time at this point. And I have an inventory. I managed to get a copy of the inventory of every single canister in the United States. And so I've been developing different reports with that information. This data was of 2013. The NRC has said there's like 2,000 of these thin canisters around the country now. You know, that's updated from 2003. So, yeah, this is shocking news. Now, the DOE, Department of Energy, is going around the country, and they're going to be in Sacramento, I think it's April 26th, to talk about consolidated interim storage, which means taking some of these existing canisters usually at plants that are already decommissioned, transporting them somewhere else in the country, these same canisters that could have cracks in them, but they don't know if they do or not, transporting them to another facility, storing them there. They don't have any pool. They don't have any plans dealing with anything that might fail. There's an NRC regulation that says you cannot transport canisters that are not perfectly intact. So if they even have partial cracks, they're not approved for transport for safety reasons. Yet they're ignoring the fact they have no way to inspect for cracks, assuming nothing's going to go wrong. And the DOE, when I bring this up at the first meeting that they had for what they call consent-based siting, trying to find some sucker community to take these things, they just ignore those questions. And when I ask, well, who, who's the technical experts that I need to talk to? Or are you going to have any meetings on the, on the technology you're planning to use? They basically blew me off and tried to send me some other government agency. So they're trying to hide this. So what people need to do, people are wondering what they can do. Number one, they need to share this information. And on the SanAnofreSafety.org homepage, I have documents and information that can help people with that. In California, the, the Department of Energy is only having a meeting in Sacramento. Of course, because where are the two active nuclear facilities or the, the hotter ones? We've got San Onofre with its spent right, right, California, yeah. you know, and then up in San Luis Obispo for Diablo Canyon. So, of course, they would have their meeting in Sacramento. Right. This is kind of what they're doing. In all the places that they're having this meeting around the country, they're not going to any location where they kind of targeted who's going to get stuck with this stuff. They're just going to places that may have something they want to get rid of. So the DOE wants to skip the part about what they want to do to a community, and they just want to focus on, well, how should we get consent? Let's talk about how we should get consent from communities. So what we need to do is to basically not allow them to get away with that. We need to go to these DOE meetings and we need to reframe the message to the media and anybody that's going to listen. We need to reframe it and say, before you talk about consent, let's talk about this, what I call a design to leak situation. You know, I mean, the, the, their proposed design is going to lead to leaking and then exploding canisters. They don't want to talk about that part. And I've personally spoken to the project lead. The DOE is trying to get money for a pilot. They call it a pilot plan to store waste from multiple nuclear plants at some undetermined site. I know that they're talking about taking the the plutonium waste from Japan and storing it at WIP, which hasn't even been functional. Well, uh, what their plan is, is to they're not bringing it straight to WIP in New Mexico. They're bringing it to Savannah River. And they're planning on having Savannah River reprocess it and separate the plutonium out. And then they're planning to send it to WIP. Well, of course they can't send it to WIP until WIP is reopened, but WIP has been totally contaminated with radiation and shut down because they had canisters blow up, or at least one canister blow up that contaminated the entire facility and released plutonium into the air in New Mexico. So it's going to end up sitting at Savannah River because WIP's not open, and I I don't see how they even are going to get it open for years and years, if not ever. So it's going to probably stay at Savannah River. It's horrible. So but getting back to this, these DOE meetings, and they're having meetings in Atlanta, Georgia, and other places around the country, it's important that we force the issue at these meetings to focus on the problem with how they're containing the waste, and don't fall into the trap of talking about what it takes for consent. We need to talk about what they're asking the communities to consent to. And most people, even the the people in charge, the decision makers, don't know about the fact 
how vulnerable we are with these canisters. It could be in the process of cracking right now and could weaken any time. I mean, we need to get that word out. So, Donna, if people wish to have a cheat sheet of sorts or talking points that they can bring up at these meetings. Do you have something like that available through San Onofre yes, Safety? Yes, right on San Onofre Safety, right on the home page, right near the top, I have a high-level handout for the viewing meeting, and then I have a longer, more detailed handout that has more references. So they have a shorter one, and then they have one that I actually submitted to the Department of Energy. Donna, the work you're doing is crucial to our safety and our understanding of the issues and we'll stay in touch and you will continue to keep the listeners of nuclear hot seat updated as to what's happening with the nuclear waste and our illusion of safety around it yeah i want to share one more thing with you i filed as an intervener with the public utility commission am requesting that uh, they not get Edison money for decommissioning and to buy more inferior canisters. This is for this San, is for San Onofre. Onofre. This is for San Onofre. Uh, Edison, Southern California, Edison wants $4.3 billion to decommission and manage waste and buy more thin canisters, inferior canisters at the site. So I filed a cost basis argument showing how these canisters would have to be replaced prematurely, and there's no funds for that. These canisters, the whole system, the thin canister goes into a concrete structure. The canister systems, each one cost about $4 million, and they're going to want to put 85 more of these there, and they haven't dealt with the problems with the existing ones on top of it. So they're likely to prematurely fail while they're sitting there. Edison has, not only has a plan for this, there's no money allocated to deal with that. There's no money for replacement canisters. There's no money to pay to put this radioactive garbage that it will be left over the, the old canisters to send them anywhere or pay for that. So I made a cost-based case with the Public Utility Commission. The judges come out with a recommendation. I actually provided the expert testimony in the legal brief. I'm working with an attorney, David uh, Pfeiffer, who's helping on the legal part of this. Her decision said, Ms. Gilmore's expert testimony and legal brief is meritorious. Okay, so basically, in legal terms, I made my case based on merit. But then she said, however, this is outside the scope, meaning this is a Nuclear Regulatory Commission jurisdiction, so they don't have any authority over this issue, which we disagree with because we have jurisdiction over costs in the state, and that that's the PUC's job is to make sure that we have the costs covered. And they're using trust fund money that's been built up over decades and once that money's gone, it's gone. And they haven't planned for any replacement or anything to go wrong. So we are filing, we filed comments back showing where we, you know, where this is a cost issue and not an NRC jurisdiction issue. So that battle's still going on. Very soon, the five PUC commissioners should be making their decision on that sometime soon in April, whenever their next meeting is, is when we're expecting it to come up. So that's what's going on. So right now at San Onofre, they don't have the money. They have not been given the money for the canisters, to buy the canisters. I believe there is still time to fight this, to stop them from putting these canisters in. The ones they want to use are even worse than the old ones. They're going to stick these thin canisters halfway down into the ground. The ground is always wet and moist there. They're putting in this concrete structure. They have air vents in the lid. Any water, critters, anything that goes in that air vent, the canisters are welded shut. So you have a canister that's put in a hole, and then you have open area around that hole, and then you have a lid that covers all of it, but the lid has vent holes so that the hot canister can have the hot air vent out. But wind, rain, dirt, critters, anything can get in those large air vents. And there's no drain in the bottom of the system. So all this, whatever stuff that's in there is just going to sit in there next to the canister. And I looked at the technical specifications to see what the whole tech's plan is. Get this. This is the plan. The employees should stick a hose down the vents in the canister and pump out any, any water. 
That is in the technical specifications. That's the plan. And right after that comes the technical specification, bend over and kiss your ass goodbye. Right. Yeah, I, you know, I actually said that I was speaking to uh, an NRC employee at a public event where they're telling us it's safe to leave these canisters here indefinitely. She found a yoga book in one of the seats after the meeting was over. And I don't know why she came up to me and asked me if this was my yoga book. And I said, well, it's not mine, but that's probably what we really need here. So we'll be flexible enough to bend over and kiss our own ass goodbye. So she looked rather shocked, but it's the truth. (laughs) It is, and it's unfortunate. Donna, thanks so much for all of the attention that you are paying to this crucial issue, which you seem to virtually own this area at this point. And we will stay in touch with you to get the latest update for the listeners at Nuclear Hot Seat. Okay, thanks, Libby. Donna Gilmore of SanOnofreSafety.org. And, of course, we will have a link up to her website on our website, NuclearHotSeat.com. Activist shout-out! Hey, movie lovers! The International Uranium Film Festival is making a one-day stop in Los Angeles on Wednesday, April 27th. We'll be screening films starting at noon. There's a red carpet at 6.30, and the international award-winning The Man Who Saved the World, which includes a cameo by Kevin Costner, will show at 7.30. Then, a nuclear power panel afterwards, including the inimitable Harvey Wasserman, activist Emilio Estevez, that's what he calls himself. I will be on the panel, and there will be others. So come join us. Be glamorous. I mean, really, how many times do we really get a chance to dress up in this movement? You also get to be righteous and see what filmmakers from around the world are saying about the nuclear issues in their consciousness, in both documentaries and dramas. For more information, you can go to uraniumfilmfestival.org, and of course, we'll have the links on the website. While you're there, we will also have a link to a video promo for a film that's not in this festival, but I think we all need to know about. It's an animation from Fukushima about what happened with the earthquake, tsunami, and the start of the nuclear accident five years ago. What's remarkable is that it features the voices of local residents playing all of the characters, so they're not acting, they are revealing part of what they are feeling and how they are feeling it. I found even the little preview that I saw immensely moving. And if a little featurette like that can be so moving, I can't wait to see the film itself. Again, we'll have the link up on the episode of Nuclear Hot Seat number 250-250. Which brings me to today's final thought. Episode 250? Who'd have thunk it? I mean, the numbers just keep creeping up, one at a time, one a week, and suddenly, here we are. Now, the actual fifth anniversary of Nuclear Hot Seat is still a few weeks away. But when the odometer flips over like it did with this episode, it gives this person pause. When I started doing Nuclear Hot Seat, it wasn't a show so much as a desperate, garbled conference call with a painfully undereducated activist trying to get someone, anyone who knew more than she did, to talk with her at 4 p.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays. I had one regular listener. Thank you, Tim. I would email him, Facebook him, and harass him into being on the call so there would be at least one person to ask a question And when my interviewee signed off, I wouldn't be stuck with that stupid music in the background from the recording service. Now, things and formats have moved on quite a bit since then. And a lot of you have been along for the ride without my hectoring you. So thank you. I'm proud of the work I've been able to do here. The range of information on episodes, the range of issues that have been covered, the sense of every week telling our story, the story of opposition to this juggernaut of an industry and an energy in terms that we can all feel how momentous is the work that we're doing. 
And I love being in this community. It is a great community. You are my tribe. And I love reaching out to you in this way every week. So please, go to the website and feel free to tootle through the archives and pick a show, any show. Nothing up my sleeve. Presto, change They'll all be, if nothing else, at least enlightening. Reminding us of where we've been and how far we've come already. When you're watching these episodes, please feel free to respond in the form of kind words, cute animal videos. If you happen to be a Scrabble fan, send me an invite through Facebook, and I promise to do my best to whoop you. But know that we're all in this together. Earth is a rock in the middle of a bubble in the middle of nowhere. What happens on Earth stays on Earth. And that includes all things nuclear. So stick around. We may have gotten to this benchmark, but there are many, many more to come. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, April 5th, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, nbcnews.com, wagner.house.gov, the Environmental Protection Agency, stlpublicradio.com, Just Moms STL on Facebook, penenergy.com, miningawareness.wordpress.com, nnsa.energy.gov. Could they have any more agencies in this country dealing with nuclear? lowhud.com, plymouth.wickedlocal.com, patch.com. PublicNewsService.org, Syracuse.com, PublicIntegrity.org, ScienceMag.org, Dianuke.org, Mirror.co.uk, Bologna.org, JapanTimes.co.jp, Fukushima-Diary.com, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, Asahi.com, FukuLeaks.org, DunReynard.wordpress.com, you fox you, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the gold standard of activists who gather on the Nuclear Hot Seat site on Facebook, which you, yes, you, are invited to visit and like. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompanied by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV on StuWebRadioNetwork.com, in New Zealand by NewZSentinel.com, and ActivateMedia.org. We are always looking for other networks to connect with, so if you know a news aggregator or community radio station that would like to carry the show, do put us in touch. Check out the archive of over 252.50 shows on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com. And we've also got the obligatory YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos. And what the heck, you can find us on iTunes. A reminder that if you sign up on the website for the free chapter from my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, it will put you on the Nuclear Hot Seat database. And you will receive notice of each show via email. And a reminder also that your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force it is for honest, accurate nuclear news. So please, do what you can this week to help us out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.